is, is clearly spelled out and which is the subject of our topic today, the gratitude. And this is clearly explained in what we call the Mangala Sutra. I think you all have heard this very, very popular sutra, this very, very popular uh, uh, teaching that was given by the Buddha where it's called the Mangala Sutra. Mangala is usually translated as the discourse on blessing. Now, blessing has a connotation of something that is provided by a god or something that is given. But here, blessing does not have that connotation. We, when we talk about the word Mangala, Mangala is how to end an unhappy state. So we experience an unhappy, uh, uh, we experience unhappiness, and when we cut that Mangala, when we cut an, an experience, that becomes a happy state. So this is what we call the Mangala Sutra, how to experience the highest happiness normally translated as the highest blessing. Now the story goes that the Buddha was approached by lay people, by, by, a, by a, a deva, to ask what is it on human life that constitutes the highest happiness. Remember we said that all human beings are concerned with happiness and how to experience it, how to achieve it. Yeah? And the, the, the people during the Buddha's time were also concerned with this question and they asked the Buddha, what is it? And the Buddha does not say, that this is interesting, the Buddha does not say that we must go into the higher experiences of meditation and uh, devotion and all of these. Yeah? He gives us very basic experiences on how to experience happiness. And he lists out actually 38 different mangalas. Call them blessings if you like. What are these 38 things that we can practice in order to achieve happiness? It's very carefully graded, this 38, starting from very basic and everybody can practice and then it goes higher and higher into the higher levels of the spiritual. So uh, this is what we call the Mangala Sutra. All right? And in that Mangala Sutra, the Buddha lists, which, where it concerns our topic today, the Buddha lists five different Mangalas. Of the 38, five, very early on in the sutra. And he says, Gara vocha nivatocha santutti katanyuta kalena dhamma savanam etang mangala muttamam. Let's take it one at a time. Santutti, in order to, be, to, to experience happiness in this life, we need. Five things the Buddha says. Gara vocha nivatocha. Reverence and humility. Santutticha katanyuta. Contentment and gratitude. Kalena dhamma savanang. Hearing the dhamma at the correct time. These are the highest blessings. So, reverence, humility, contentment, gratitude. Now we come. Here is the Buddha specifying to us that if we practice gratitude, it is one of the ways, I emphasize, gratitude is one of the ways in which you develop the attitude of mind which leads to happiness. If you have gratitude, the Buddha teaches us, we can experience happiness uh, on a worldly level. Now that is the point. Now, the importance of the word katanyuta. Katanyuta translates as duty to benefactors. Yeah? Knowing what has been done. And 
wanting to do something about it. Now, gratitude, the Buddha explains to us, is something that when we live in this life, we cannot live alone. Yeah? We are dependent on others and we are dependent on other circumstances. Now, all these other circumstances yeah, we will, that, that benefit us, we will say are our benefactors. And one, we know that they have benefited us in some way or another, we develop first the happiness that somebody has done something for us. But that's not enough. Katan Yuta implies that not only do we uh, acknowledge this, this goodness that has been done, but we develop an urge to do something about it. Now this is, in my mind, the Buddhist idea of what gratitude implies. Gratitude implies knowing, recognizing what has been done for us, and that having been done for us, then we go to do something about it. It has to be reciprocated. Okay? And uh, it implies that knowledge is alone not enough. Knowing that something has been good, good has been done, is not enough. We need to go beyond that to do something about it. Therefore, in Buddhism we are taught that knowledge has to be converted to action. Knowledge has to be converted to action. This action part. That is what makes it very important that as practicing Buddhists, we, uh, we physicalize our sense of gratitude towards others. So these two have to be tied together when we talk about gratitude in a Buddhist sense. Knowing something has been done and doing something about it. And we will try and see how this goes on later. Okay? So katan yuta, duty to benefactors, knowing what has been done and wanting to do something about it. Now, to emphasize or to highlight why this gratitude, this practice of gratitude is so important in Buddhism, yeah, we go back to the example of the Buddha himself. Did you know that before the Buddha even spoke one word, long before, eight weeks before the Buddha gave the first sermon where he teaches the Dhamma that he has discovered to the five monks for the first time, the Buddha had already started teaching. And the very first lesson that the Buddha taught, surprisingly, was this lesson of gratitude. Even before he spoke a single word, remember, he was enlightened under the Bodhi tree. And for the first week, he sat under the Bodhi tree, enjoying the bliss of enlightenment that he had gained. Now, the second week, yeah, there was nobody around. The Buddha was all by himself. The Buddha had just attained Nirvana. He had just attained uh, Arahantahood. He had just attained Buddhahood. And then on the second week, the scriptures tell us that the Buddha moved from under the tree to a little hill facing the tree. And for an entire week, the Buddha gazed at the tree unblinking for one whole week. What was he doing? He was expressing his gratitude to the, it wasn't a human being, it wasn't a god. It wasn't even a sentient being, it was a tree. And the Buddha expressed his gratitude to the tree for having provided him with the shelter which then helped him to gain his enlightenment. So we get this first lesson of gratitude. And if we want to follow the Buddha's path, it's obvious that one, we have a mangala, we have this blessing when we experience gratitude on the one hand and on the other hand we have the Buddha's example telling us that it is necessary for us to know what good has been done to us and also 
to do something about it. In this case, the Buddha gazed at the tree. Yeah? Then it goes further. Again, in the area of gratitude, the, one of the things <coughs> that the Buddha is reputed to have done is having gained his enlightenment, he looked back. Who was it that made it possible in this life to gain that enlightenment. First the tree, now he will talk about the human beings. And of course, the first person to have helped him was his mother, who gave birth to him. And in all of Buddhist practice, we pay great emphasis, and the Buddha himself pays great emphasis on the gratitude that we must play, uh, we must uh, pay to our mothers and our fathers, but we'll come back to that later. Okay? For the time being, how did the Buddha help his mother? She, as you know, she passed away five days after he was born. And after he was born, when she had passed away, he was brought up by his aunt, Mahaprajapati Gotami. Uh, but when he gained enlightenment, it is said, that he went up to Tavatimsa heaven, where his mother had gone after she had passed away and she was residing there. And the Buddha taught her the way to attain Arahantahood. Because the best way, the highest way in Buddhism that we can pay back somebody is to be able to give this secret of ultimate happiness, the arahantahood. And this is one way in which, and the Buddha highlights that by having taught his mother the way to attain arahantahood. That was the way he repaid his mother. At the same time, he also recognized how important his father was. Now, when he had gained enlightenment, he came back to Kapilavastu and he helped his father at his deathbed to attain arahantahood as well. Now, there is no higher way in which you can pay your gratitude to somebody except to help them to gain this final goal of Buddhism. That is the attainment of Nirvana. So the Buddha helps, uh, uh, pays attention or expresses his gratitude to his, the tree, and he does something about it. He ex expresses his gratitude to his mother, does something about it, and then he expresses his gratitude to his father, and does something about it. Now there's a third group that the Buddha helps as well. And this is, remember when the Buddha for six years was going under the, the training program as a bodhisattva, looking for arahantahood, he was attended to by five ascetics. And these five ascetics had been with him. But before that, before he even met these five ascetics and went on the path to gain, uh, to look for enlightenment, he had gone to two separate teachers. And these teachers had helped him. But he found that whatever they had achieved and whatever they taught him was not enough for him to gain this final attainment of Nibbana. However, when he became a Buddha and he had gained this final uh, Buddhahood, his sense of gratitude led him to see whether he could go back to his first teacher found that that first teacher had passed away and was beyond the Buddha's help. Then he thought about his second teacher and found out that his second teacher had just passed away and also was not able to, at to attain arahantahood. So he remembered those five ascetics. And then he said, this is my t opportunity to go and help them. So then the Buddha takes the trouble to go all the way. He walks all the way to Varanasi 
and there he meets these five ascetics and then he gives his first sermon. And the objective of giving the first sermon is to share with them the secret that he had gained, the secret of perfect happiness. And it was out of this sense of gratitude to them who had been assisting him in, uh, for six years and it was to pay back. So knew he recognized the help that they had given him and having given him that he recognizes that it is the one way to help them gain arahantahood. That's the highest way of, uh, of attaining uh, of experiencing or expressing gratitude. So here we have the Buddha's example in this thing. Okay? Now, <clears throat> this brings us to the next point, which is, what is it that we can be grateful for? Of course, there's everything in this world, everything that happens to us every day that is in some way beneficial to us, sometimes not even beneficial. And yet, in some way, it teaches us some lesson. And that also, if we can recognize. Yes, so all the time there are. But in Buddhism, we recognize, and I said I'll come back to this point, that there are three objects of gratitude that the Buddha highlights. And throughout the scriptures, we have references to these three objects of gratitude. Don't forget, I've already said other objects are important as well. But these are the three main objects. And the first one is parents. We have already mentioned how the Buddha said, uh, expressed his gratitude to his father and mother. And now, the, throughout the scriptures, in many scriptures like Sigalavada Sutra, Vyagapada Sutra, these, all these emphasize how we must never forget, if we are going to follow the Buddhist path, to express our gratitude, express our gratitude to our father and mother. Usually in Buddhism, we don't say father and mother, we say mother and father. That's significant, yeah? Because it is mother who comes first. It's mother who bears us, for nine months, it's a mother who bears all the, uh, un, uh, the discomforts of motherhood and so on. So, you, our first object of gratitude is m mother, followed by father. All right? And also, it is said, why is it that mother and father are that important, the Buddha refers to mother and father as the gods at home, the brahmas at home. You don't need a god in heaven to help you, your parents who look after you, your parents who brought you to this world, who gave you life, this, your parents who educated you and gave you all this support, they are the real gods in your life. So, be, why? Because just like gods, Brahma, yeah? Brahma has four qualities. Metta, Karuna, Mudita, Upekka. What is Metta? Loving kindness. Metta, Karuna, compassion. Mudita, sympathetic joy. And Upekka. Now, these four qualities of gods, the Buddha says, are expressed by parents throughout their period as parents. When a child is born, what does a mother do? A mother, even before the child is born, while the child is still in the womb, what does the mother do? She expresses her loving kindness. Yeah? She doesn't even know whether this is going to be a boy or a girl. She doesn't even know what it's going to look like. But already, without knowing this, she expresses her unconditional love for the child. Even when the child is born, without complaining, she looks after the child, she provides at great discomfort to herself. 
This, the Buddha says, is metta. This is a godlike quality. Metta. For this, we need to be grateful. I said, katanyuta means knowing what has been done for you and doing something about it. Now, at the moment, we are trying to examine what is it that our parents did? What did they do? Now we have seen how mothers express the quality of a god by practicing metta. Then, of course, when we are helpless and weak and uh, frightened, who is there to help us? Mothers. Yeah? And what do they do when we are sick? Yeah, the, the kind of, uh, uh, the, 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 the kind of uh, experience that they have, yeah? the sensations, the feelings that they express, are definitely karuna. What is karuna? Compassion. So, this is a godlike quality, and this is expressed by a mother. So, metta karuna. Then, when we are small and helpless and in need, we get, we enjoy a mother's metta and karuna. However, when the child has grown up and it becomes independent, then we cannot cling on to our parents, uh, our children anymore. This is where a lot of people go wrong. And they cling on and expect their children to be young. The Buddha says, a time must come when we must learn to let go. Let the children experience their own happiness. This is mudita. Mudita is when our children are doing well and when they are independent, we rejoice at that. Mudita is called sympathetic joy. Sympathetic joy is the ability to be able to share someone else's happiness without a sense of jealousy without a sense of regret or whatever. Complete, unconditional joy at somebody's experience. In my mind, parents are the only people who can truly, truly experience mudita. Only parents will truly rejoice when children do better than them. So, like the gods, like the Brahmas, parents have metta, Karuna Mudita. Then comes the most, the highest level at which even parents must learn to do, and a lot of parents do that. A time must come when we practice Upeka. Upeka is when we cut ourselves emotionally. Yeah? This is not a negative cutting off emotionally, it is a growing out of attachment, of letting the children go and not being involved, not being attached to their sufferings or their joy. In mudita, in karuna, you share their suffering. In mudita, you share their joy. But in upeka, you go, you transcend both of these. And when all of these happen, the Buddha says, this is an object of grace. When you understand how much parents have done for you, then <coughs> you, you, you pay back. And you, you pay back knowing that it's not enough to say thank you. You have to do something. You have to train this knowledge into action, translate it into action, and practice metta, karuna, mudita, opeka. And this is how you, you pay back to the gods at home. Then the second object of gratitude are teachers. Of course, you must know, understand, we all recognize that whatever we are, whoever we are, were in some way or another helped by our teachers. And our teachers had really no relationships with us, but with joy, they shared whatever knowledge that they had. They were instrumental in making the kind of useful citizens we are. And when we recognize that, because they are the ones who gave us the knowledge, the knowledge of our ancestors. And when we have that understanding that our teachers have done this for us, then 
of course it is time to show our gratitude to our teachers so we have parents we have gratitude and then <clears throat> the buddha says that probably more important than these because these have helped us in many senses in a material sense spiritual friends what the buddha calls kalyana mitras spiritual friends are those who not only help us materially but are far more concerned with helping us tread the spiritual path who themselves follow the ways the experiences of the buddha and to practice as the spiritual life to reach higher levels of humanity and they support us in this yeah there is a uh, an incident where uh, venerable ananda told the buddha that friends are half friends are half the spiritual life the buddha said no they are not half the spiritual life they are all the spiritual life so in terms of spiritual friends of course monks yeah and those of us who are practicing buddhists who who encourage us to follow this path these we call spiritual friends and they need to be appreciated and they need to be thanked the so we have these three but now in the mahayana tradition besides these three they also include a fourth object of gratitude and which i think is very very beautiful and very necessary in today's day and age and this fourth object is the government now the, a lot of the time we tend to not expect yeah Uh, not not feel gratitude to the government but especially in this very very difficult times when we went through the the covid uh, the uh, pandemic yeah and the way in which our government reacted and the strength and the clarity with which, this has to be appreciated yeah in many countries where the leaders were going all haywire and giving all kinds of wrong teachings we in our small country had the leadership and the strength and the wisdom and of course we have to be grateful to the public who cooperated with the government and did not demand of all things freedom freedom there's a lot of freedom freedom is not m- me being able to go to the beach because i i need the sun freedom is much more difficult than that yeah freedom is worrying about other people's needs so it's not just about me freedom also means responsibility so to come back to our topic yeah it's sometimes we take governments for granted especially our government yeah and i think we this is a good time for us to reflect and be grateful and to consider ways in which we can cooperate we can make this job easier okay so i like this uh, fourth object of gratitude parents uh, uh, t- uh, t- uh, teachers spiritual friends and government so these four objects of gratitude now question why must we show gratitude after all i was born i did everything myself yeah why should i f- have a gratitude yeah this is an example to others when we show gratitude we have this ability we have this very positive way of thinking this positive mentality that we developed yeah which are positive mentalities and therefore they do us good psychologically yeah also when we show gratitude it is a an example to others is very easy to be cynical it is very easy to find fault yeah but if we find gratitude we develop positive states of mind there's a lovely little story i'd like to share with you about this gratitude it's a story about 
uh, it's to do with parents, gratitude to parents, which is the main idea that I'm trying to follow. But at the same time, <laughs> this story is, is uh, very, uh, uh, gives us a room for thought. Now the story goes like this. Uh, this is uh, supposed to have happened in Nepal, yeah, where they have a lot of tea pickers, people who carry big baskets on their back and pluck tea. All right. Now, in a family of uh, tea pickers, there were a young man and he had a, a wife. Yeah, so a young man and a young wife and they had a six-year-old boy, a son. Now, living with the man, his wife and this little boy was the man's father, an old man. Now, this old man was a very difficult person to live with. He was very bad tempered, he was very demanding, he was very the difficult person to live with. To the point that one day, the daughter-in-law told the son, I cannot live with your father anymore. You, either you get rid of him or I am going to leave you. Now this poor guy, he had no choice. So he decides that he must get rid of his father. So what does he do? Early in the morning, he puts his father in the basket that he carries to pluck tea and he starts leaving the house. As he is leaving the house with his father in the basket at the back, his son runs after him and says, Daddy, Daddy, where are you taking Grandpa? And the father says, well, son, Grandpa is old and grandpa is very troublesome, therefore I am going to take him to the top of the mountain. What are you going to do when he gets to the top of the mountain? Oh, I'll leave him there. What will happen to him? Oh, some wild animals will come and eat him up and he will die. And then we, I will come back. The young boy said, oh, is that what's going to happen to grandpa? waited a few minutes, then he ran after his father and said, Daddy, Daddy, please make sure after you have left Grandpa, you bring the basket back. And he said, why? He said, because don't forget when you grow old, I have to take you in that basket to leave you in the mountain out there. Now, monkey see, monkey do. So if we don't teach gratitude, we don't practice gratitude, our children will not learn gratitude. So that's the reason we end. It benefits us. Yeah? And if this lesson can be taught, yeah, we call it the story of the tea picker's son. Okay. Uh, next question we can ask, why are we ungrateful? Why, why are we ungrateful? The scriptures teaches us there are many reasons for this ingratitude that we practice. One is just simply not knowing. Sometimes we don't know what good has been done for us. Yeah? Uh, and therefore we do nothing about it. Now that, that's one level. But really what we should do to overcome that not knowing is make the effort to find out. Now a good example I just gave was the government. It's good for us to, to find out what has been done. How much more with all the, the internet that is uh, available to us, we can see how much has been done. And the more we know about how much has been done, the more gratitude we can uh, uh, experience. And that experience of gratitude is a positive state of mind, which is very beneficial to us. So not knowing is a cause of uh, ingratitude. Now, sometimes we fail to recognize that it is a benefit. <clears throat> I remember when I was very young, uh, my parents used to force me to eat vegetables. I hated vegetables. And they used to just sit there with a stick and say, you finish all these vegetables. I used to think that they hated me. And I, of course, hated them. Why? Because they forced me to eat vegetables. Today I know that eating vegetables is so necessary. So at that time, I fail to recognize it as a benefit. Today I know. So sometimes we fail to recognize that something, and it is therefore our duty to look 
for what has been good done good to us and how we can replace that we can't just say oh i didn't know you have to find out okay a lot of the time again back to the government a lot of the time to our parents we take things for granted we just expect this is so it has to be so after all my parents gave birth to me it's their responsibility to provide for me yeah i take it for granted i take it i voted for this government okay it's my government it's their job to pay back to us i'm taking it for granted then of course not so nice plain selfishness whatever has been done for me as good i take it as my right so it's it's mine so i don't need to be thankful to anybody for this yeah so we need to look at ourselves yeah and when we are not experiencing gratitude for whatever reason we have to ask ourselves is this because of selfishness yeah and what can we do about that then of course again plain forgetfulness we can we are so caught up with all the problems of life that we do not take the time to sit back and see what benefits we have had from circumstances and people around us it's time to sit back and experience this and when we do that we become more aware of the benefits that we are enjoying all right and we will have the the opportunity to to identify what has been done for us and try and find ways and means to pay back katan yuta know what has been done for you and to be able to do something to repay that these are positive elements that we need to experience now how do you repay the buddha no, not the buddha the commentaries identify three types of priorities when we think about repay what we call low priority low priority is material needs and you may know this very well yeah a lot of people especially during chinese new year or some other festival they remember their parents so they go there and give their parents some money give them some goods they have some provisions okay job done for the year i've paid my filial piety okay this we call low priority where we repay with material needs but i've already mentioned this earlier that is a very low level it's it's good it's okay but it is not uh, as satisfying and it is not as spiritual and it is not as noble as other ways in which you can repay your gratitude what we call middle priority as children particularly one way in which you can thank your parents is don't give them any headaches it's that alone is good enough yeah study well or whatever all right and when you are working don't give more problems to your parents or don't give problems in the case of the government just don't give problem that itself is a way of repaying okay then of course <coughs> what we have already mentioned high priority low priority material needs middle priority not causing headaches to the world not becoming a nuisance to those around us but the high priority is where kalyana mitra we become spiritual friends who perform our religious rites and who encourage everybody to become spiritual and when we do that we repay all those particularly parents when they are old maybe they are not very highly educated maybe they have not had the experience of going to a temple or studying the dhamma the best way just like the buddha went to tavatimsa heaven to help his mother went to uh, back to kapila was to help his father in the same way the highest way in which we as buddhists can repay our parents is 
to help them in their spiritual progress. And when they have passed away, it is very, very important that we remember, and this is spelled out very clearly, that when they have passed away, we remember to pray for them and to uh, help them in their life. After. <coughs> Honestly, there's very little we can do once they have passed away. But we should remember their memory. And remember the monkey see, monkey do, like the tea plucker. Yeah? If we remember our departed relatives, if we remember particularly our parents, those who have done good for us, when we pass away, our children would have learned that this is the right way to do this. Okay? So these are three ways in which we can repay. Yeah? And uh, one of the most important, most common sutras where the Buddha talks about this is, we all know this one, the Sigalovada Sutra. Sigalovada Sutra is where the Buddha refers to a young man and teaches this young man how to be a good citizen, how to pay respects, how to show gratitude, yeah? starting with parents, yeah? uh, spouses, uh, uh, parents, teachers, spouses, friends, religious teachers, and employees. So in these six directions, yeah, I am being in the center, how do I refer to all of this? How do I react to them? And this is in the Sigalovada Sutra. So there, where the Buddha talks about rights versus responsibilities. All right? And there, coming back to our topic on gratitude, there the Buddha spells out, what are the considerations you must have when you are uh, trying to understand your relationship with your parents. Here is a way of uh, thinking, of reflecting. Once supported by them, my parents, I will now be their support. I will perform duties incumbent upon them. I will keep the lineage and traditions of the family. I will make myself worthy of their heritage. I will give alms on their behalf when they are dead. These are the things I must do in order to remember and show my gratitude towards my parents. In the Thigalovada. Now, we all, we, uh, this expression of gratitude and so on is a way of maintaining peace and happiness within ourselves and to create an atmosphere of peace and happiness on, on a daily basis. Don't forget, that's not the end. Don't forget, while you have these positive states of mind, you have, as we have mentioned earlier, your responsibility to reach to higher spiritual levels. Now, this is the beginning level. Yeah? This is where you set the tone to practice a Buddhist path. Not ever forgetting that your final destination is Arahanta Wood. Yeah? Gratitude alone won't get you there. But it will create the, intent, the, the atmosphere for you to experience the happiness, which you will make it easier for you to follow the spiritual path. Now, how do you see that you are on the spiritual path? Yeah? If you are grateful, it is a sign that you are making progress in the spiritual path. People who are not grateful are cynical. People who are not grateful are selfish, demanding. They are not nice people. But if you start consciously practicing gratitude, looking for where this people have benefited you, not just people but circumstances have benefited you, that is the beginning of the spiritual path. All right? And um, you will, as a result of experiencing uh, gratitude, you will experience a greater appreciation of life. You'll find 
you, yourself a nicer person to live with and you'll find that people around you have so many nice qualities. Look for those qualities. Yeah? Just as you have bad qualities, they have bad qualities. But there is no need to look for those. Look for those excuses to be grateful. Yeah. Gratitude also increases your own self-worth. A grateful person is a noble person. A grateful person is a happy person. So this is obviously going to benefit you psychologically. So develop your self-worth. And then, of course, when you have gratitude, you will have what we are all looking for, inner peace and happiness. So gratitude is what we need. Yeah? It's one of the ways, not all the way, it's a very important way yeah? in order to develop a sense of peace. When you have this sense of positive thoughts inside of you, you will find yourself living with yourself, able to live with yourself. A lot of the problems of the world today is where we don't like ourselves. We have so many excuses to find reasons to be unhappy. If we consciously, step by step, it's not easy, but it can be done, and the more you do it, the easier it becomes. What is it? Gratitude. So, this is a very limited talk, I must emphasize that. There's so many things that we need to do on the spiritual path that we follow as Buddhists, outlined in the eight four, Noble Eightfold Path. Yeah? But here is a nice practical way of being happy every day in a simple uh, manner. With that, I say thank you. May you all be well and happy. Thank you, Uncle Vijay, for the wonderful sharing. Uh, it's a uh, lot of uh, gratitude. It's not just uh, act thoughts of uh, gratefulness. As Uncle Vijay has shared just now, gratitude is not just thinking in our minds, but also must be accompanied by action. So we must do things to show our gratitude. Now, there are a few questions from the audience, uh, Uncle Vijaya. I'll read out the questions to you. From Brother Hai Eng, how do we maintain our inner happiness in our daily lives when we lead normal working, social family lives, interacting with others who are at times grumpy, rude, aggressive, full of hatred and other negative emotions of behavior? Thank you. Is that the question? Yeah. How do I maintain happiness in the, in the turbulence that's going on around me? That's entirely what the Buddha, Buddha's teaching is all about. He talks about our life. From the time we are born till the time we die, there's so many things that are going against us. And a lot of the time, it's beyond us, like this uh, 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 COVID. I personally had nothing to do with it, but I am paying for it. And the whole world has become connected and the whole world is paying for something we didn't do. All right? and, and we say, why me? Yeah, that is the whole thing. The Buddha has clearly stated to us that the world will not turn around for our benefit. It turns around according to its own laws. And this we call the Dhamma. Dhamma means that which upholds the universe, the principles on which this universe operates. And this is not nice. The secret in Buddhism is how do you rise above this? Now in Malay we say, Bila jato tangga, jangan timpa tangga pula. Meaning, if you are hit by everything, don't suffer with the suffering. The teaching of the Buddha, this is the lotus flower. Yeah, says that while we are suffering all around here, physically and so on, we must not allow the mind to be affected as well. That is the secret. It's very difficult. It is the ability to sit back, to relax, to see what's happening and not to get affected. 
the, the Buddha went through, even as a Buddha, he went through a lot of problems, ill health and so on. But when all this was happening, the mind was not allowed to, to suffer as well. So your question was, how do I cope with all the things that are uh, angry, uh, employers and so on? How do I go to it? Bila jatuh tangga, jangan timpa tangga. So be like the lotus flower. Train your mind to keep peace while everything else around you is going bad. And the Buddha talks about the, the solid rock, that the solid rock remains unchanged in the face of thunder and lightning, that the turbulence around us. How do we maintain that? That is when we follow the Noble Eightfold Path, this comes to us. This is how we train ourselves. It, it doesn't come from prayer. It comes from training ourselves and developing the mind to accept what is happening. When you suffer, don't suffer with the suffering. This is the teaching of the Buddha. Thank you. Thank you, Uncle Vijay. Another question from the same person, Hai Eng. The Buddha was reluctant to spread the Dhamma. Do you agree that it is difficult to guide human beings to practice the Dhamma in this age of technology or sensual desires? What do you recommend for us to practice in our daily lives to spread the Dhamma effectively without creating inner and outer conflicts with others who may not like our approach in practicing and spreading the Dhamma? Uh, actually, this is a double-edged. Uh, meaning that it's it's uh, the, the Buddha was reluctant to teach. Yes, the Buddha was reluctant to teach because he knew the in, enormity of the task. He said there were so many people. You see, a lotus. There are three types of lotuses. One is under the water. One is just below the water, and one that has risen above. Now, the one that is below the water, that's the vast majority of human beings, they don't want to be taught, they cannot even apply themselves. It's difficult to waste our time with them. On the other hand, there's another group that's already enlightened. They, they already don't need help anymore. The ones that we are talking about is the one that's below, just below the water. Just below the water, meaning that when the sun rises, they will come up. When they hear the Dhamma, they will be able to respond to it and benefit from the Dhamma. So when we go about, say, the, the, the question was, uh, how do I stop not making a nuisance of myself by going around and preaching people about Buddhism and trying to grasp Buddhism and catch them and, and, and convert them against their will. No, that, that, that's not the way. Where our own behavior, our own practice, yeah, must give us an inner peace and inner happiness, which is reflected when people see that we are not pushing our goodness and our, our, our sealer and our Buddhist practice at everybody else, but it brings us inner peace and inner calm. That itself, it's its own ambassador. When people see that we behave and that our practice of the Buddha's teaching makes us peaceful people who are at peace with others, that, that is the best advertisement. There is no need to go around and proselytize. There's no need to go around and show that Buddhism is the greatest religion to mankind. When we do that, we, we are pushing it down. No, I think the way to practice Buddhism is by letting our own behavior, our own peace, our own calm do its job. And then when people see us and they were attracted to our way of life, they come to us, so be it, just like that lotus, it will. Then they will want to learn, they'll want to know what makes it tick. So the secret is don't push it. Just yourself, look after your own self and practice it. And in the practice of that, just take the five precepts. Don't kill, don't steal, don't commit sexual misconduct, don't tell lies, don't take drugs. Just in that, 
while I am defending myself in this negative way, I don't kill, I don't steal. Remember, there is a very positive aspect to it as well. I don't kill, but I protect life. I don't steal, I protect property. I don't commit sexual misconduct. I respect the bodies of others and so on. You see, so it's a double-edged sword, meaning that if I practice the Buddha's teaching, then that is the best way to spread the Buddha's teaching. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Agar Vijay. Uncle Achanbra Brahmali gave the same answer last week. Ah. He was asked, uh, how do you spread the Dhamma? He says, uh, just be an example. People see you have changed, then they yeah. will be curious, they will want to follow you. Yeah. Oh, oh. <laughs> that's follow. nice. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Okay, another question from the same uh, high Eng. In the pursuit of happiness, how do we strike a balance in leading a worldly family life and cultivating a spiritual life to reach a higher level of humanity? The two are closely connected. Yeah? You cannot lead a spiritual life without at the same time benefiting those around you. Right? Sure, it is uh, generally accepted that it is more difficult to practice a spiritual life when you are burdened with the responsibilities of the lay life. And it's easier, as some monks so they say, but don't forget, members of the Sangha have their own challenges as well. But we are talking about us as lay people. Yes, there are all these challenges, but with understanding. Yeah? And not trying to do too much. I think that is the, that is the secret. Uh, the Buddha compares his teaching to the ocean. See, when we are on the beach, yeah, it's very shallow. But as we go deeper and deeper, it becomes, uh, uh, there's, there's more and more water, all right? When we are on the beach, we can uh, control our lives uh, according to the principles of the Sigalo or the Sutra. How do I relate to my spouse? How do I relate to my friends? How do I relate to my teachers? How do I relate to the six aspects of society? Me in the middle, reacting knowing that there are rights and there are responsibilities. As a husband, I have rights. But as a husband, I have responsibilities. And what is my right becomes the responsibility of others. What is the responsibility of others becomes my right. When I see that and I work a little bit at a time like the ocean that goes deeper, then I can get myself into that frame of mind don't forget in Buddhism, we are not only talking about this life. We are talking about other lives. So in a sense, this life is a preparation for me to do better in other lives. This life, I chose the lay life. But, but if I practice spirituality like the lotus flower, while I am involved with the, the lay life, I also pay attention to my spiritual well-being. This is personal to me, to my spiritual well-being. Chances are that when I pass away in my next life, I will be born with the circumstances which will help me to more emphasize the spiritual life and leave the lay life behind. Yeah? But to sit in this lay life and be unhappy about it, I think that's not the way to go. It is to find happiness within your limitations. Again, the lotus flower. Your limitations are all these demands made on you by society, which you have chosen to live in. But you can, by practicing metta, karuna, mudita, opeka, in the periods of spiritual life. The two can be done. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Uncle Vijay. Uh, Sister Haying, for more details on this uh, aspect of Buddhism, next session, I'm inviting a nun from Po uh, Kwang Sang to share on humanistic Buddhism, mm. which is uh, how Buddhism lives in society uh, in, during turbulent times. So it will be on yes. the 28th of June, two weeks from now. Yeah.
Okay, another question from Sister Ai Chan. Fifth, gratitude. Can ancestry offerings be part of spiritual growth? Absolutely. Ancestral, remember we talked about gratitude. Gratitude is recognizing everything that your ancestors did for you. You are not there by your own right. You are the result of everything your ancestors thought and did for the past 2,000 years or even more. So whatever has been done, you cannot forget them. Yeah, you, you may be materialistic and say, oh, they're gone and there's nothing to do with them. Okay, maybe they're gone, maybe they're not there. Yeah? And, but you're doing these kinds of expressions of gratitude in their honor, yeah, benefits you and the society you live in. Certainly, it's an example to the young, to the others, that when you uh, practice gratitude, when you practice uh, acknowledging what has been done for you, you get humility and, and, and you become a noble person. Yeah? So the ancestors may have gone, may not be there anymore. Maybe it's a materialistic world at the end. And the Buddha says that in one of his um, Kalama Sutra. At the end of it, he says that there may be no life after death, but that shouldn't bother us at this stage. In this life, you are showing the example of being grateful to, for your being what you are. And if you're not happy with what you are, then find out reasons, but why is this so? Come to terms with yourself. Yeah, so I say, and the Buddha's many, many occasions, he says that we must remember our ancestors. Yeah, normally we talk about seven generations in the past, but not, not necessarily. Everybody that has gone in front of me is responsible for what I am now. And for that, I must be grateful. And when I do that, I lead by example. And the society around me, starting with my children, yeah, learns this very positive quality of being positive about what is happening around the world. Otherwise, jato tinga timpa tanga. What is going to happen is I'm going to be cynical. I'm not be able to understand, accept whatever good. And the person who pays the price for that is me. I am have I am entertaining all these negative thoughts. Therefore, I am unhappy. Therefore, the Buddha says, "Be the lotus flower." Yeah. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Gavija. Very nice uh, answer. Another question from Hai Eng. How can the practice of mindfulness meditation guide us to develop happiness? Absolutely. Mindfulness is always about being in the moment. Being in the moment. The Buddha says, the past is gone. You can do nothing about it. Really, the past is gone. You can do nothing about it. You cannot change the past. Neither can you predict or control the future. You can do a few things, but really at the end of the day, you are helpless. However, what you can control is this moment. So happiness or suffering depends on what happens at this moment. And what mindfulness does is brings you to that moment. And the teaching of the Buddha is that if you are happy all at this moment of time, at this, you are happy at this moment of time, then it, this moment becomes yesterday. So you are happy now, it became yesterday. Yesterday you were happy. And if you are happy tomorrow, that's tomorrow. You are happy again. So what happens is you are happy, 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 happy. Yeah, and you are happy all the time. And what brings you to that happiness? Mindfulness, being aware. And what is mindfulness? Being aware of four great efforts to prevent unwholesome states. This has to be happening at just one moment, yeah? Prevent unwholesome states from arising. Eradicate unwholesome states already arisen. Promote wholesome states. Maintain, maintain wholesome states. So mindfulness requires you to be all the time alert to doing these four. And when you're constantly concerned with this, 
you have no time for self-pity. You have no time for anger. You have no time for what other people are doing. You are. Uh, so the secret of happiness is mindfulness. Thank you, Dr. Vijay. So keep the questions coming. Uh, anybody who wants the questions, you just post on Facebook and we'll pick up your answers, your questions here. There's a Chinese saying that one parent can bring up 10 children, but 10 children cannot support one parent. Uncle, can you please comment? Yes, my sisters always used to say this. The answer to that, my children, my, my, my nephew and my nieces gave to my sister was, yes, one parent can, but I did not choose to be born from you. It's you who asked you to give birth to me? This is not my problem. Why do I have to be grateful? Well, they were joking, of course. They did, they, but but the, 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 the point about this is we get the kind of children we deserve. Children coming to us, parents coming to us, this is all karmic. Yeah, and that way we, it's not by accident that these, my children have come to me. It is their karma as well as my karma. So when we are aware of that and we realize that we have a duty, we have an obligation to each other, then we will play out our karmas. And the, the demand that one parent who brought up 10 children yeah, must have 10 children reciprocating to them one cannot because that lima jari sama all right not five children all are different some will be grateful some will be not grateful some will be grateful at some time some will be grateful at other time so if we have mudita we have this sympathetic joy if we can look at our children in a positive way rather than expect if something good comes to us okay that's a lottery if it doesn't come to us okay i don't deserve it so if we have that attitude that sort of philosophic attitude towards our children we will create a lot less animosity and guilt yeah, one of the things that parents, uh, I think Asian parents are guilty of is creating guilt. Uh, one mother can bring up 10 children, 10 children cannot bring up one mother. 10 children have got 10 children to look after. So they also have their problems. When you marry them off, we must learn non-attachment. Then we learn peace, upeka, peace within ourselves. So this is what the teaching of the Buddha is all about. Yeah. Then this is what gratitude. We need to be gratitude, to be grateful to our children. There are things that they brought. They brought us a lot of happiness. Yeah, ten children must have brought some kind of happiness. Grateful for that. But otherwise, well, accept things as they are. And karma. I, I deserve the children I get, and my children deserve me as their parent for better or for worse usually for worse thank you <laughs> thank, thank you uncle okay there's a question from tigris lupus uncle vijaya how does one practice gratitude towards our grandparents who had passed away even before you were born yes the memory remember we talked about ancestors Grandparents have joined the ancestors. Yes, they were there. They have gone before we were born. Yes. But it is your grandparents that gave rise to your parents with their values, their way of doing things. And that was passed on to you. you, you, you the genes you carry came from your grandparents and their parents and their parents and so on. All right. And for all of this, we don't have to physically go to the, to, to the graveyard and burn uh, papers. That has its value. But what I'm saying here is spiritually, mentally, you remember them. Yeah? And you bring them to your thought. There is uh, examples during the Buddha's time. Uh, maybe we have time to share this with you. King Bimbisara one day had a very bad dream. 
very, very frightening dream. And the dream was, uh, no, he had given Dana. He had given Dana and uh, everything went on perfectly well. And that night he thought he was going to have a happy, peaceful night. But rather than that, he had a terrible dream and he saw all his ancestors coming back to him and, and, and terrifying him and mourning. And he went to the Buddha the next morning and said, what, why, to explain the meaning of this. And the Buddha said, this is because when you were giving dana, okay, when you were giving dana, your departed ancestors all were very happy. They thought that they could partake in the dana. Seven generations, yeah? Then, so King Bimbisara had no way of knowing anybody beyond his grandparents. Okay, so, but anyway, uh, and they all came, they were happy, but you gave the dana, but you did not share the merits with them. So they were very upset. And so that night they came to disturb him. So the Buddha taught Bimbisara to give a dana to specifically, yeah, remember the departed ones and to give them the dana as a descendant. So in, in the scriptures, we have this experience and we have the Buddha's authority telling us that we should remember our ancestors, not necessarily need to know them physically or to have known them. And, and the giving of dana, the sharing of dana, they are all very positive mental spiritual activities. And this, Spiritual activities are what makes us feel good. That's what religion is all about, feeling good. And this helps us. These are physical ways in which we create states of peace and happiness within ourselves. Thank you. Thank you. So after every good event, must share merits, right? Until yes. Jaya, share merits after this. Okay. Okay. Another question from Hai Eng. Is collective karma one of the causes for COVID-19 since mm. this virus has caused mm. so much unhappiness to so many people? Thank you, because this is something that has really bothered me. I haven't, I'm trying to read up on this. I have not yet. If somebody does, fine, please let me know. Um, collective karma certainly plays a role. There is in the teaching of the Buddha, there is my personal individual karma that I bring through samsara with me. And at the same time, there is a, a, a collective karma, uh, which I share with my community. Now, let, let, let's take us Malaysians. Uh, yeah? We are all born in Malaysia. We are born under a certain set of conditions. Yeah? And all of us have come together yeah, and we, I, 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 I'd like to be positive about this. I think we have done a very good job of putting a handle on this COVID thing in Malaysia. When you compare that with other countries where the numbers are going in thousands and they, they, they don't even have enough time to build uh, graves, to dig graves, we are not like that. So in a sense, Patiru Padesa Vasocha, what the, here is saying, to be born in a suitable location. Now the people in New Zealand, for example, yeah, they were born in a suitable location. They together were born in a suit where they were able to actually declare themselves COVID free. Yeah, we are very close to that. We are, I mean, given our location, we are not safe but at least we are in a position. Compare that to other countries with huge populations, which are economically in no position even to buy inhalers. Yeah, and so we feel sorry for them. And I believe that they are suffering collectively. They were born in this collective thing. Maybe among them, there are people who will not be affected. Yeah, but to answer your question, yes, I think we do have a corporate responsibility. And, and if as a nation, yeah, we practice metta karuna mudita upeka 
as a nation, we will benefit. But if as a nation, led by the wrong kind of uh, leaders, yeah, we generate anger, animosity, hatred, passing the buck on others. Yeah, we, we see it happening in many parts of the world. Yeah, if the leaders are goading their people, the police brutality and all of this, yeah, I feel the atmosphere needs to be. Remember in the, oh, what do you call it, uh, uh, Ratana Sutra. In the Ratana Sutra, there was a pestilence. People were dying, just like here, people were dying and there were so many dying, they didn't even have the time to bury their dead. And corpses were rotting. And because of that, it was very bad. All right. And how the Buddha taught Venerable Ananda, the Ratana Sutra, to go and uh, recite the Ratana Sutra to spread peace, to send the vibrations of peace and uh, kindness towards all. These vibrations were so strong that the rains fell and all these pestilences were removed. All right. And so there, you again, you can see that it was not an individual karma that was working, but it was a group karma. And, and I, am, I, I cannot tell you honestly that I understand this aspect of Buddhism that well. And it's something that I need to go and learn. Yeah? And I'll be grateful if somebody sends me any kinds of material which explains the role of, car, uh, of uh, corporate karma or group karma as opposed to individual karma. I think there's a, there's a link. But the, where the teaching comes, I don't know. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Ankar Vijay. Okay, another question from uh, Sister Ai Chan. Siblings can fight among themselves after the parents passed on, but if you are in inner peace, how can one control the outer interference since they are still fated to be your siblings and their families? Back again. Bila jatuh tangga, jangan timba tangga. Yes, this is, we hear this everywhere in the world. Siblings fighting, not necessarily after their parents die, but including the parents as well. So there's, you know, there's so much of unhappiness. And I, as an individual member of that family, yeah, jatuh tangga, jangan timba tangga. All that you can do, is keep your own inner peace, don't make matters worse, don't get involved, yeah, and show by your personal experience that you are happy and they are not. And maybe some of it will dry, uh, pass on to them. I know families like this. I know families where people are all fighting and one or two said, do what you like. We are not involved, yeah. And where the in-laws also, sometimes it's the in-laws that create more problems than the, the siblings themselves. So how do you learn, like the lotus flower, to remain above it? As a sibling, part of your karma, you really cannot get away from it. Yeah, But physically, you may be involved, but your mind should not be allowed to descend to anger, hatred and delusion. You have to keep your mind pure. Not easy, absolutely not easy. But the higher the mountain, the greater the joy when you have reached the top. So it's not easy, but you be an example to others by not reciprocating anger for anger. When there is anger, there must come from you love. And keep telling yourself, I am a Buddhist, this is my teaching, all right? You may be looked upon as a fool. People might say that you are you're, you're not involved with the world, you're not involved in the family, maybe so, yeah? I care for the family, but I'm not going to get involved in the family's anger, okay? And that way, maybe you can help to calm the waters as well. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Agar Vijay. It's true. A lot of small issues. Uh, people add Nia, tambah Nia, tambah magnify, yes. magnify the whole thing. Then yes. worse. Yeah. Yeah. So just keep passive. 
Okay, another question from Nalin uh, JM. Dear Uncle Vijay, it is said that we could only transfer merits to those we have contact with. In other words, who we know. Yes. Only then can the merits be transferred to them. Yes. However, if we do not know our ancestors, could yes. we still transfer merits to them? Yeah. Could they still um, receive merits from us? Thank you. Yeah. Uh, transfer merits, the teaching of transfer merit, there, there is a, a, a certain sutta, Tirukoda Sutra, I think it's called, where we, uh, it's explained yeah, which level of when, when somebody passes away, they, they become ancestors, pretas. Preta means ancestor. When they become ancestors, um, there are certain levels. Those who have already done a lot of good, created a good karma and so on, and they are born, let's say, in the Deva worlds, they are in no need of your um, merits. So they cannot receive your merits. In that case, when you cannot receive your merits, because you have done something good, because you have done something mentally positive, spiritually positive, it comes back to you. You benefit from the good that you have done, even though your ancestors don't need it. That's one category. There's another category where they are born in the hell worlds. And in the hell worlds, they have done so much of evil, they cannot receive whatever good. Even then, because your mind has been pure and so on, you benefit from it. There is, however, in this whole thing, one small category of departed relatives yeah, who have not done enough good to go to the Deva worlds or enough evil to qualify into the hell world. Yeah? These, I think you will call them the hungry ghosts. Yeah? They are in a position to receive whatever you have done for them. A very small uh, category. Yeah? We don't take the risk, so we treat all our departed relatives as going into that category, even though in reality they may have gone to heaven, uh, because we don't know. Okay? So that little category can receive. The rest can't. The implication there is only some can receive and most cannot, but Whatever it is doing, we are doing it with a generous heart. We are doing it with a pure heart. The beneficiary is ultimately us. Those who are uh, outside of this, this, this category, those who are outside of it cannot receive. Yeah? And also it is said that we must have some kind of a mental collection. The, in, when, when I'm saying this, I'm reminded of our late chief. He's the one who explained this to me. He said that when we, we can only connect mentally with those who have some connection with us, meaning that they, they, they must know we exist and we must know they exist. Chief Reverend said, used to say, this is like having their handphone number and we, we can connect with them by, by the phone. The others cannot. That, that's the teaching. Okay, so if you don't know other people, what do you do? We practice metta. Metta is neutral. You know, metta bhavana, wishing all beings, eh, all beings meaning not only physical beings, but beings there. Okay, we practice metta towards them and they'll be benefited in that way. But dana is meant to be uh, uh, beneficial to this small category of people only. I hope I have answered that question. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Uncle. Very well answered. Okay. One last question from uh, Hai Eng. Is our last thought moment very important to determine our future happiness in the next rebirth? In the teaching of the Theravada tradition, which we belong to, the last moment is the most important moment of our lives. Because throughout our, our lives, we have created thoughts. And it's the last thought moment which will determine our next life. Okay, So that last thought moment can come about in several ways. One way is usually the common way is habitual. Habitual meaning, how did I conduct my life throughout this existence? 
from the time I was born. Yeah, we find people who are very kind, very calm, very peaceful. Yeah, very generous, very nice people, and they are genuinely so. So the chances are that when they die, this last thought moment takes precedence. And this last thought moment will determine where you are going to be born. Are you going to be born in an animal world? Are you going to be born in a hell world? Are you going to be born in a, a deva world? Are you going to be born in a happy human existence or whatever? That will be determined by your last thought moment, which was determined by your habitual thinking. That's one way. Another way is while the, you do have those habitual thoughts, there may be a strong karma that comes from a previous life which lay under. And that last moment, this strong karma could, could surface. You may have lived a perfectly good life all along, but in a previous life, you may have done something wrong. And the memory of that is stored in your consciousness. So that last thought moment can affect. Okay. So this is why when people die, yeah, we get around them and then we chant and we make them remember the good things they did, hoping that we can in some way influence that last thought moment, which will determine their next life. Uh, in a sense, this is cheating because we, all the way you behave well, yeah, and then suddenly it changes. It, it, there are many stories in the sutras which uh, explain this, that yes, maybe the last thought moment can be um, a negative thought moment, can be changed to a positive thought moment, but it will be very weak. So you can be born in a royal family in the next life for two, three weeks maybe then you die and then your your last thought moment comes back again and you go to hell or whatever I, I do you get the point that the last thought moment is what in the Theravada tradition is what determines your next life and there are many ways in which that last thought moment can be uh, brought about can be brought about okay so we are told that throughout our lives we must practice yeah positive thinking right thoughts so that at the moment of death when we are helpless we cannot control that last thought moment when that happens the last thought moment will be a positive one which will work in our benefit okay if you are an arahan you have no last thought moment it's there's nothing to go forward to so when you die your body comes to an end and your consciousness comes to an end as well that is if you are an arahant which i hope you are thank you okay that's the last question uh thank you uncle vijay for the wonderful sharing and all the good handling of the questions so can uncle please uh, share merits before we close the session today namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa brothers and sisters in the dhamma for the last two hours our minds have been gainfully engaged in listening to a talk on gratitude in that time our minds were free from the defilements of anger, hatred, greed, jealousy, and so on, as a result of which we have gained a powerful spiritual energy, which we call metta. Now, uh, 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 the, the, this, this spiritual energy, this, um, the spiritual energy uh, is something that we, we gain and we should develop throughout our mind. Spend a moment Sorry, I've got lost myself. Uh, spend a moment examining those powerful spiritual moments that you have gained. Brothers and sisters, it is pos possible to share merits with our departed relatives and friends. We call these merits. 
spend a moment sharing merits with our departed relatives and friends, hoping that they will gain a better life or they will be freed from whatever unhappy birth that they are uh, suffering from now. At the same time, brothers and sisters, we may have departed relatives and friends. We have also devas, devas who protect us. And we can share our merits with them. We can transfer merits to our departed relatives and we share merits with our uh, devas. Spend a moment sharing merits with the devas. Idam me nati nang ho tu sukita on tu natayo. Idam me nati nang ho tu sukita on tu natayo. Idam me nati nang ho tu sukita on tu. Natayo sabbe satta bhavantu sukitatta. May you all be well and happy. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Thank you. Thank you, Akka Vijaya, for the wonderful sharing. So, our next session is on the 28th of June. At uh, 9 30, we will be inviting a uh, nun from Fo Kuang San, the vice chairman of the Fo Kuang San Malaysia, member Yu Teng. She'll be sharing on with the topic Humanistic Buddhism in Turbulent Times. And the week after that, on the July the 5th, we'll be having a quiz, a Buddhist quiz, with a uh, verbal ayasma. Arya Damika from uh, SPS Taiping, where he will be doing an online quiz, interactive. So this time will be a bit different. There will be a lot of Q and A's. Okay, so uh, look, watch, look out for our next two sessions, and uh, hope to see you soon. Thank you, thank you, Uncle Vijay. Okay, goodbye, everyone. Thank you.
place to be.